Welcome to another round of SDH's coverage of USL League One. This week, the guest is going to be the head coach of South Georgia Tormenta, Ian Cameron. Tormenta, winners of four on the spin. They have rocketed up the standings to where they had started out very, very roughly. Now, after 11 matches, they're at five and six. Right now, fourth place and 15 points in the table. As we go a little further along, we'll let you know the matches that are coming up around the corner, what's happening this weekend, and some of the news and notes in and around the league. But first, here is our guest for this week. It is South Georgia Tormenta head coach Ian Cameron talking about the recent successes that have gotten them to fourth place. All right, coach, I'm catching you on the bus as you're heading to Osceola Heritage Park, getting ready for Tormenta and Toronto FC2. And so what's this going on behind you with all the singing? What's, what's this going on? Every away trip, we try to do a wee bit of something trivia-wise with the groups. Uh, the assistant staff do a, a tremendous job. Last week, it was the weakest link. This, uh, the week before, we did a bit of Jeopardy. And this week, we're doing a wee bit of a sing-along. So we started with a, a trivia of movie and TV themes. And then now they've moved on to each group's given a word. And they have to come up with a pop song that's got that word embedded in it. And the first team to falter or out. So... There's been some dodgy singing, there's been some dodgy lyrics, and there's been some made-up songs, but they seem to be having a good time with it. So who's who usually ends up on the winning teams of all of these particular activities? Is there one guy that kind of ends up always at the top of the ladder, or is it a mix Is it a mix here? Uh, I think when it comes to trivia and general knowledge, I think Pablo and Lars are, are pretty tuned in. Uh, Vinny, who's joined us, is pretty bright as well. But and then, uh, and then I, th I think there's a few boys that use their phones very, very well. Um, so I, I won't name them, but no, this, it rotates. We try to mix up the groups a wee bit, but it's a good laugh. So obviously the, the last month has definitely been something that has been different since the beginning of the season. I know that there was an article that came out on the, the USL League One website about a formation change, getting things to a, a, a 5 4 one from where you were initially. How much thought went into the formation change after the start that the team had to go from what you had to where you are? Look, you're always trying to tweak little things to, to see, okay, you start the, you start the preseason with an idea, an ideology of what you're looking to do. But the one thing I said to the group and the whole staff have said to the group from day one is we're not married to any one formation. We're, we're married to some principles in which we want to play, how we want to go about our business. But the formations are adjustable. And, um, you know, we started with 4 3, 3 and there's aspects of it that we really liked and there's a couple of results in pre-season that we're really happy with. But inevitably, as the games that went on, it's just not, we're not defending our box well enough and we're not attacking the opponent's box well enough. I hope for whatever reasons, you know, some of them will address in off-season. But right now, it seems that this formation suits the personnel we have the best. And, uh, and yeah, so far, so good. Well, and this is a discussion that we have on the network a lot about the difference between philosophy and tactics. Philosophy is something that's ingrained from the beginning where tactics is what you're looking at in a match by match basis. And sometimes inside the match itself, your tactics change. And I think that, uh, yes, while your formations changed, I think the philosophy pretty much has stayed true to what you had coming in, true? Yeah, I mean, I think I think one of the barriers of change information for coaching staffs is just a lot of players have preconceived notions of something they associate with a formation. You know, they might associate 4-3-3 with Man City and Liverpool and so forth. They might associate a 3-4-3 or 5-4-1 with, you know, a Conte team or, or so forth. But, you know, the advent of all these tactics allows for a greater flexibility. You know, they see top team information quite readily. And I think what we've just done is try to educate the boys on the formation. It's just simply can sometimes be one player being moved one position. You know, a 3-4-3 or a 4-3-3 three, three, three can become a 4-4-2 four, four, diamond by moving the nine from in front of the wingers to behind the wingers and so forth. So that kind of approach to educating them on, on the positional play that we're trying to put into place can, uh, can help dissipate some of the either overly positive or overly negative connotations of certain formations and just really make sure that we're talking about the principles of play, like you said, is, is what's key to what Tormenta is. And again, 3-4-3, three, 5-4-4-1, three, four, 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 whatever you want to call it right now, is working for us right now. But we, even though we're having good results, we might change it again. We might adapt again later in the season. Uh, but we're not married to any one formation, but there are principles that are bedrocks of what we do for sure. 
What did you learn about yourself as a coach in the last month, I guess maybe the last five or six weeks, carrying out of the, the where you started to this win streak? And then what do the guys think they learned about themselves? Oh, I mean, I think I think you know not to get too high with the highs and too low with the lows. And it's, you can say that on paper and you can and do all these things. But I think the reality is when you're in a slump, it is very, very difficult. There's no doubt about it. You know, you're... You, you wear that on you at all times. You know, it affects your family life. It affects your general mood when you wake up, your sleep's less and all these things. But that's the that's the responsibility that comes with making the decision that you want to be in a high-performance environment. You know, and that's and when you make the decision that that's the course of your the vacation that you want to take, then you have to accept that it's not all going to be roses and it's and there's going to be times where you've really got to um, dig deep. And I think what... I think what our players have done a very good job of, and I think the staff have done a very good job of, is accepting even when we're one and six that we weren't a bad team. We just weren't getting the balance right and we weren't turning games in our favour. And then I think even right now, I think that balance is equally as important, even though we're going through a purple patch and we're winning games and, and we look strong. We don't all of a sudden think we've arrived. We don't all of a sudden think we've solved it. We're a really good team. It's just balance when you're losing and balance when you're winning and it's incredibly important in life and it's incredibly important in sports and business first three of the wins when you're four on the spin were one nil one nil one nil and then the defending champs come to town and it's three one did not necessarily the result surprise you considering all the work that you've put in but I guess the margin of the result did that did the two goal win surprise you and getting three on the board considering that you had one nil wins coming in no, because I think I think we saw signals of that the week before. Although we only beat Toronto one 0 at home um, in the second last game we played, in the second half we really opened them up and created a lot of chances and should have won that by two or three goals. Um, the first tie down there, I think, should have been a draw to be perfectly honest. But I think the game at home we should have scored more. So we knew with the kind of the bigger squad that we have right now, and some we've got about five guys back in the last few weeks, which has paid dividends tenfold, and. Um, and that's come to fruition and really showed in the, in the latter portions of games were a very, very difficult team to play against. Um, so we we knew we could be strong. We got a wee inclination of the week before. And the reality is Greenville weren't at their strongest. You know, they played on the Wednesday before. They, um, obviously, Smart went out injured and, and Alex Morell had been suspended for the game. So they didn't have their deepest squad. So we, we anticipated going into that game that we thought would be close going into the second half and that we would win the game later in the game. That was... That was how we maybe foresaw the game going. I didn't expect to be 2-0 up at halftime, to be perfectly honest, but knowing that we're 2-0 up at halftime, I trusted the boys' ability to to separate in the second half. Um, and we certainly showed that. So, you know, I've said it a couple of times, and we believe it. I don't think by any stretch of the imagination we have the best 11, starting 11 in this league. But I am, in the current composition, the squad or staff are very happy that we have an 18-man roster on a game day that will go to bat against anybody. Um, and that's a good place to be. All right. And so since I am talking to you on the bus, as you're heading to uh, to Osceola to take on uh, Toronto FC2 in the midweek, this is the next topic that I want to get into you with. It's those quick turns. It's the midweek weekend, weekend, midweek, all these kind of quick turns that you're having to do right now. When it comes to the, the overall strength, and I mean this in the, the endurance and the, the physical nature of things, where do you think the guys are right now in handling these weekend, midweek, weekend, quick transitions where you might be playing three in an eight-day period? I think mentally they're in a pretty good place. I mean, the boys would much rather play matches than train. That's the reality. Coaches sometimes would rather train, uh, but players want to play matches. So I think I think mentally they're in a really good place. I think over time, you can't. the bodies are going to wear down. And I, I think... The staff just have to do a really good job of trying to recognise that just before it comes to fruition and, and recognise some guys need a break. So going into this Wednesday's game, this is maybe an opportune moment for us to do a little bit of rotation uh, for guys that deserve to start, but also to just to try to protect a couple of bodies. And again, there's gambles that come with that. We've kept a relatively stable lineup for the last few weeks, got results. It's a gamble to change it, but I'd rather change it now and get ahead of something than push somebody to the point where they could possibly get injured and Look, that's not an exact science. It's one of the hardest jobs for coaching staffs in any sport to do is to know when to give somebody a guy a break or when to keep, keep a same lineup uh, with momentum. So these are some questions that we're starting to have. But 
I think the staff are just happy to have these questions, happy to be in a place where we've got decisions to make, where we've got the flexibility to move some guys around and um, give somebody else a shot to start a game because they're deserving of the moment. So, um, yeah, it's, it's going to be tough. And Toronto are in the exact same place. They are, they are, their game schedule has been um, incredibly difficult. You know, and let alone the fact that they've had to change their location once in between. But those boys are young. Those boys are MLS pedigree, so I'm not going to feel too sorry for them. But I do have sympathy for the staff in terms of their preparation and so forth. But we'll uh, we'll give them those sympathies after the game, but hopefully take care of business beforehand. Because that's the rub in a situation like this, where you've got a team that's in rhythm and you've won four on the spin, and everything is rolling in a certain direction yet you're on a quick turn and it's that double edge of, okay, do I keep going with what I've done to get me here or take that break, pull some pieces out, try to get some guys some run. I mean, that's a very delicate balance to have in a situation like this. It, it is. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's again, is the biggest challenge, but we feel like, again, I think because of the composition of our squad, I go back to, I don't think we've got any, league-wide superstars. We certainly got good players who are high up in the metrics in the league for different areas, but I think the strength of our team is our squad. The strength is the balance we have right now across 18 guys. So with that in mind, we do feel like a lot of guys are interchangeable. We do feel like we'll put out a similar product week in, week out with a different composition of players put together because we feel like everybody's singing off the same song sheet right now and everybody's committed to the cause for the club. So we're quite happy, and I think that allows us the flexibility to make some rotations. But again, it's not an exact science. Now we're going to try and make a couple of tweaks, give Toronto a different look, because you can say keep doing the same thing and and, uh, and and be scared to change things. But then if you lose a game, then you, you look back in hindsight with 2020 and say, oh, we should have done this, we should have done that. We can only make decisions on the information we have at hand. And right now we think that we can make some changes and still put out a team that can win games at the USL1 level. And at the same time, something that I'm going to talk about a little more in depth after this interview is over three guys on the uh, team of the week roster, two of them at the back. And, and well, actually three of them really with Lars, Luca and Marco, three of, of the guys that have been integral to the success, not just in the last month or so, but across the board when they've all been healthy, but all of them now in uh, the team of the week for this week. Yes. It's, I'm very happy for those three boys. They, they're full and deserving of that accolade and, the reality is, and all coaches say, that's a, that's a team accolade. To have three boys on a team means the team's done well. And that's there's a lot of unsung heroes in that moment. But Marco's in a really good place. Lucas adjusted to a new position exceptionally well in the last couple of weeks. And then, obviously, we're very happy to have Lars back at full health and, and, and leading the team from the back. So those guys are, are even as conscious as anybody that that's a team award and, and that the team deserve full credit for the accolade that they were given. All right, before you go, I, I have to ask about this because it's a topic that we really haven't had the chance to go in depth in a little bit since the last time we visited, the Euros. Have you had the chance to even enjoy the Euros at all or have you been locked in on this win streak? Have you had some time to yourself to watch the Euros and what's been going on? I have only watched one game of the Euros. I've seen little bits and pieces. But I've only won, watched one game, and that was a that was a bad result for Scotland when we tied zero zero of England because really we should have won the game. We're thoroughly deserving of the game, so we were really disappointed as a nation with a a board and draw against a team that is uh, inferior to us on the day. Um, so we are looking to rectify that in t minus forty one minutes against a very talented Croatia team. But we have a a wonderful opportunity ahead of us. And uh, this will be the second game I watch. My father is at the game. My sister is at the game. Um, so very, very excited about the opportunity. Scotland have a his have never made the, the, the next round of a major championship. We've always come very, very close. And, uh, you know, as a, as a country, we're, we've got a weighted breath to see if this is going to be another nearly story or if it's, a, if it's a moment where some of these boys can make themselves heroes. So... We're excited at the opportunity to play a game and knowing that we win, we're through. So we shall see. No Billy Gilmore. Who has to step up? Yeah, the, how good was he the other day? I mean, 20 years old and had the bravery to go in and, and boss a game like that. I thought I thought he did tremendously well. So, um, no, nah, it's, it's really cool. And again, you know, a lot of these boys coming through is, is a testament to some of the, the, the grassroots stuff going on in Scotland and the young coaches uh, across the country. Um, but we'll see. 
we've uh, we're a wholehearted team. We've not scored any goals yet, so we're going to have to score our first goal. But we certainly nobody can say we're not committed as a country. So I expect a committed performance today, and a, and a wee bit of quality uh, might be the difference for today. So fingers crossed. Ian Cameron, head coach, South Georgia torment, who, who gets to enjoy, and I'm, and I'm putting that word in quotation marks, you get to watch the last game in the group stage, and it's going to be a big one for your home country. Thanks for hanging out with us on the bus. Be safe. Enjoy the competitions going on behind you as they're trying to be like Pitch Perfect 2, where it's the you know Das Sound Machine going up against the Barden Bellas, those kinds of things. Have fun. Be safe. Good luck in, at Osceola against Toronto FC 2. We'll catch up with you soon. Thanks for having us. All right, let's take a look at the schedule and tell you what happened last week that got us to this particular moment in time. And going back to last Saturday, Richmond and Union Omaha out of 1-1 draw. Toronto FC 2 at Osceola Heritage Park knocked off Fort Lauderdale CF 2-1. Uh, New England Revolution 2 shut out forward Madison at Bree Stevens 2-0. South Georgia Tormenta, we talked about that with Coach Cameron, knocking off Greenville Triumph 3-1 surprising result at uh, or Russell Park, and then at Globe Life, North Texas, and FC Tucson were in a goalless draw. Chattanooga Red Wolves knocked off North Carolina FC by the score of 3-2. to two. As promised, let's take a look at Team of the Week here in USL League 1. Starting at the back, Wallace Lapsley is in net for FC Tucson. Three at the back, Faraday Sosa. We talked to him last week. Jason caught up with uh, the former Silverbacks product uh, from uh, Union Omaha. Uh, Ryan Spalding from New England Revolution 2. Lars Eckenrode from South Georgia Tormenta in the midfield, midfield of four. It's uh, it's Luca from what we talked about with uh, South Georgia Tormenta, Jaquil Marshall Ruddy from Toronto FC2, Marco Micheletta, Marco Micheletto from uh, Tormenta, and Jaden Nelson from Toronto FC2 as well. Up front, your three, Juan Galindrez, who ends up as your player of the week in USL League One, Marius Loomis, who we've caught up with also here on the show from Greenville Triumph, and Mark Hernandez from Chattanooga Red Wolves as well. So uh, Galindez was your player of the week for week 11, and he got two goals off the bench in the 3-2 win against North Carolina FC back on Sunday, one in the 51st, one in the 73rd. So let's take a look at the standings heading into this week because we have the midweek matches and we have uh, the games this weekend. So here in the midweek, Union Omaha averaging two points a match, nine matches played, 18 points there at the top, and they are unbeaten in their last four. Chattanooga have rocketed up the standings, winning four of their last five, seven matches played. They are at 16 points in second. Greenville, eight matches played. They're at 16 also. South Georgia Tormenta with 11, winning four in a row. They've got 15 points, total of five and six. Fort Lauderdale, they have played the most matches so far this season. They've played 12 and they are at 14 points. Richmond on goal difference right now is your team that is sixth and would be in the playoffs if everything started today. They're at 12 points. Ford Madison at 12 points. They're in seventh. North Texas is eight to 11 points. And uh, New Two and Toronto FC Two both at 10 points at nine and 10th. FC Tucson is at nine points. And North Carolina FC has lost four in a row. They are 0 6 and 1 on the season, only one point on the year looking at your schedule coming up once again midweek and weekend it's another one of those uh, chances for the league to have a couple of matches in the middle and then some on the weekend your wednesday once again at legacy early forward madison making the trip to greenville to take on the triumph and as you heard from coach cameron they're on the bus heading down to osceola heritage to take on toronto fc2 friday night at wake med it is richmond visiting north carolina fc saturday the 26th you have four more matches. Greenville heading to Chattanooga to take on Red Wolves at CHI Memorial. Uh, North Texas traveling to New England Revolution 2 at Gillette Stadium. That's at 7 o'clock, 7.30 at Drive Pink. Toronto FC 2 goes down from uh, Osceola Heritage to take on Fort Lauderdale CF. And 8 o'clock at Werner Park, it is FC Tucson and Union Omaha. And we will have matches again on Wednesday the 30th. Other news and notes from around the league to wrap things up. Cindy Wendell is now going to serve as president of the USL to Spokane. That was announced this week as well. And uh, some really cool news out of uh, North Texas SC. They have completed the transfer of uh, David Rodriguez to Liga MX. Atletico San Luis had been uh, using uh, David Rodriguez, the midfielder, as one of their players and now North Texas has announced that they've reached a transfer agreement with Atletico San Luis for the club's first ever outgoing player transfer. Obviously terms not disclosed, but the 19 year old uh, helped 
in their first season at North Texas for the, the league title. He was alone to Atletico San Luis back on January 25th of 2021. So in uh, five months time, he's gone from being a loanee to being part of Atletico San Luis. Four appearances, two starts, joined the FC Dallas Academy back in 2017, scored 10 goals in 13 games ahead of their inaugural season. First professional goal came uh, in May of 2019. 30 matches played in two seasons with North Texas, two goals and, and added assist along the way. But great news for League One, great news for North Texas as well as David Rodriguez now heads to Atletico San Luis. Don't forget to go to USL League One, one.com so you can vote on your fans' choice for goal of the week for week 11. Your nominees, Marius Loomis for Greenville, Lars Eckenrode for Tormenta, and Michael Sekulius for New England. Sekulius had his uh, second great goal in a week against Madison and a right-footed shot into the corner, Lars Eckenrode. It was the, the header past Dallas J in the Greenville match from Luca Mayer and Marius Loomis. Uh, once again, a great sequence there for their match against North Carolina FC on the 16th. So those are your three that you can vote for at uslleagueone.com for League One Goal of the Week. That is another uh, look through USL League One. Once again, enjoy USL League One, whether it's on ESPN Plus, if you are not in a market where you can watch a match, or if you can have a chance to go catch a match, go catch a match. It's going to be another busy week in USL League One with teams playing midweek and weekend. So once again, thanks to South Georgia Tormenta and for head coach Ian Cameron catching up with us on the bus as they were heading to their midweek matchup for this week. So for Jason, Jarrett, Nick, everybody here at SDH, I'm just John. Play it safe, everybody. Enjoy USL League One. We'll catch up with you next week. There can be only one!